Hello and welcome to Royale Without Cheese, our bi-weekly podcast in which we discuss both the classic and the unknown of Hollywood and foreign cinema from the then and now. We are your hosts, me, Tomás Ferreira, Leonard Miranda. Hey there, Tomás. Hey, hey. And Miguel Aydo. Hello there. Hi there. Three filmmakers in an informal dialogue with a film review each episode. As part of our Mardi Gras, reviews in both English and Portuguese will be available for different listeners. This episode will be in English, and we'll be having a go at Roger Corman's House of Usher. Portuguese speakers can head to the Portuguese-labeled content section. Now, sit back and hope you enjoy. Have a good time. Have a good time. I can start, I guess, um, with a quick, uh, with a quick note. Um, I think the movie is fun. Um, although it's one of those films that you got to see from the context of, you know, of what it is, which is a B movie. So, I mean, if I'm too critical, I mean, I'll judge, for example, the acting, especially of the, of the guy that plays Philip which kind of looks a little stiff. Um, and of course, you know, certain visual effects and sort of the campiness of it all. But I mean, if you, if you, if you just accept that it's a B film and it, it was was made with a low budget, I mean, pretty much accept it and, and have a really good time. Well, what most interested me in the film, uh, the main idea I took away from it was uh, that, um, and I found interesting, was that normally in um, a horror film, uh, which it is the genre, you have what most uh, grabs you is this progression to unveiling the main mystery of the story, which um, is comes around the midpoint of uh, the narrative in the film, which is um, a death being this having this greater role in the family and the family family being accursed with all these murderers and assassins and uh, horrible evil people like uh, Vincent Price describes <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they you know they need to be locked down in that house and Madeline is the last seed of it and she cannot marry him so the spirit the, the seed of evil will be you know spread around the world and so forth I think what is interesting is not the progression to um, unveiling said uh, mystery but actually uh, the post revelation that's the most interesting part in the film for me which uh, which is this uh, enamorment uh, of the film with the idea of uh, death in the on the on the on the cellar or 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 you know uh, death being near us in the house and, and that being embodied by this living dead persona which becomes Madeline is interesting because it gives a lot of leeway for the actual monster is now physical let's say but uh, interestingly enough. Um, by then the movie is really playing with uh, what is real what is not real and all the fantastic elements in the film are really uh, could be very you know are really very real I mean the house the problem with the house is really uh, <clears throat> with some price you need a house renovation there's no little thing bad with the house itself there's ju it's just a house renovation okay and, and then also uh, another advice stop doing Francis Bacon paintings <laughs> putting them around the house <laughs> I mean if you stop that I, I, I guess things will be a little bit more nicer for your house guests <laughs> That's what I think. And then, what about having an actual cemetery instead of having copies in the cell? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I think the mood will be better. <laughs> it's not very inviting at all. It's not very inviting, you know. And, you know, if you stop... Also, <laughs> you can also see... You can also go see a doctor for that. Oh my God, the sounds, you know, of sickness. Because, uh, you know, the it sounds, sounds like... side touch, whatever. Yeah, it's Everything. Sounds, at first, it is Man, getting a little... Ill. It's going a little bit to comedy, but uh, at first when I saw that, it seemed like uh, you're bullshitting me, right? Because it, it feels like you're... It feels like you're trolling the guy. Oh, the sounds... <laughs> I, don't, I can't stand them. I cannot talk to you. Right, of course. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, when, it's, that, it's, when that chandelier uh, falls, yeah. he approaches like the balcony. Oh, what was that sound? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
It feels like an easy way to cop out a conversation that you don't want to have. Uh, oh. oh my god! <laughs> it just goes away. I'm very sensitive to sound. I'm very Your sensitive. voice. Your voice. I can't listen to it. I'm just like, what a dick. <laughs> anyway, and I just I, coming back to the serious side of it. I think that uh, really what I want to say is that there's no zombie in the film. She 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 is really just this living person who's put. In, very traumatized with putting this very traumatic situation of living first living off living with this brother who is a maniac and probably has this all real or not family history behind him and wants to trap her there and she ends up in a coffin and so she ends up really you know claustrophobic and the years of experience from that lets her come out a little bit murderous more than a little bit murderous towards her brother and all those things are a little bit you could believe them uh as for the character that is and um it's not a zombie and the house like i said it's a little problem of house renovation and so so all the effects of <laughs> it coming down crumbling down and the storms are things that you could assess as real and in the midst of all of that that's what's interesting in, in the midst of questioning is this real or not real well everything is based on a certain realism nothing here is really uh, fantastic but it's being painted with this um uh, very heightened reality, I think, um, supernatural thing, as if it was. And then what I find interesting, as I was saying, some of the progression to unveiling the mystery is the post-revelation and the journey that you go with Philip or Mr. Winthrop. <laughs> Winthrop. And I, I think it's interesting because uh, you are like, you start getting into this uh, heightened reality uh, of fear and doubt with him, you know, where is she, uh, what part of the house, because she then disappears, you, know, you don't have really a, a, an idea of the whereabouts of the body, and it, it, you go to different places, you are in reality, questioning the brother, where is she, but then you go to a dream, which is one of the most, uh, being a B-movie, uh, it's one of the most beautiful, uh, simple film sequences um, of horror that I've seen, with this blue tint and the smoke, and all these cluttered people in this kind of setting room going, ooh, the face of Vincent Price, it's all so heightened in your face, but at the same time, it's so claustrophobic. People are so close together, and then you're so close to the faces. There's this haptic feeling towards uh, being close to something, being close to death or to the body that that essentially isn't there. You're trying to find the whereabouts of it. So you're always uh, dancing between uh, finding the body, not finding the body, finding the horror, not finding the horror. And eventually he does, and it's not there. It's just a cough, it's empty, and you're still trying to find this tangible, physical, living thing, which is fear, which is horror, which is this zombie thing around the house. And when he does, you have that kind of cliche of the, the trickling blood on the floor that then leads to the door, and she's completely different, which also leads me to say, Guys, do not fall in love for a girl called Madeline because we it's we have living proof that it's a horrible thing. <laughs> like by Vertigo and all this film, yeah, it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> There's a history of Madeline and death people, yeah. But yeah, that's what I found most interesting, that the film really gained gravitas after uh, Madeline dies and it's really a roller coaster of, um, you know, interesting things coming up, like the house being having this labyrinth inside the walls and then to actually use the device of him being him uh roderick being sensitive to sounds with uh the sister inside the walls and him being able to hear her and he has that kind of confrontation with uh, the brother this the, the brother uh, the the husband to be about can't you hear her the she's twisting and turning on the coffin oh the blood <laughs> <laughs> <It's right. laughs> uh some prices you He's know great. camp camp and his acting makes this film because if philip yeah. is stiff and and his acting is bad and hers is okay he's just he's the main attraction uh i think that that scene between them is very rich in you know trying to to pull the secrets and and the truth from him is trying by through the means of that device of, of what he suffers um because it just makes the scene so much more uh, tense even if it is camp um and also i think the 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 side of the plasticity i would say the the fakeness of 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 the setting is and the, and the tree it just makes it even more um kind of this distant world that is almost true 
but it isn't in, in this language of what is real, what is not real. Because, you know, you see the cardboard walls of the house, you know, the trees. How I'm always questioning how they did this because these trees look real, but at the same time, the floor doesn't. It's And you're always questioning because you have this awareness, like Michael said, of... Uh, I just called you Michael in English. <laughs> Michael, like Michael, Michael said. Uh, like Michael said. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, of, I'll take uh, it. I'll take it and I'll buy it. So, um, you know, always thinking about, because of the nature of the awareness of the B move, you're always thinking uh, of what's real, what's not real, how much of this is constructed, how much it isn't. So I think that adds to the, to the fact that this is a horror film and it plays with, reality and the supernatural what's fake what's reality um yeah so i think those are the strong points of the film what did you think yeah i thought i was very impressed with the film in general i didn't mm -hmm. really feel like oh i'm watching a b movie yeah there are certain things that a little campy a little you know comes yeah. with the territory of this kind of horror film for me more than b films um and yeah i thought it mostly looked great i think the the colors are beautiful even it's like there's a lot of color but it's not really a colorful film right it's very it's kind of muted it's kind of browns yeah it's... lots of browns great like there's a scene where she's lying in bed and winthrop is meeting her and it's all dark not all dark but like there the the window is closed then he goes open the window but the weather is all gray, so it barely makes a difference. It's like, oh, there's a little more light, but it's still the same tone, very moody, and it works. Yeah, but I do think that without Vincent Price, this movie would not probably wouldn't work. He makes the film. He's the, yeah, he's the show because the scenes without him do feel a bit more like. So uh, can we move on? <laughs> can we get get to him again? He's he's so much fun. And at the same time, like, I do believe some, I do believe like his condition, the, like the, because like when we first meet him, the way he's talking, speaking very, very, please, Mr. Winthrop, please do not use your words like that. Please don't speak so loud. <laughs> the way he speaks, he sounds yeah. like a, yeah. a bit like Werner Herzog as well, but like with a more English accent. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you were speaking of the initial... Uh, we see Winthrop running, uh, going through on a horse through those trees, right? I read that it's about. It was actually Corman heard about a fire in Hollywood, and it was like, okay, yeah. let's go there, let's shoot it what the immediately. Fuck? Like what? the post after it. That's that's really ingenious. <laughs> and I think even the the barn, uh, not the barn, the house was a barn that w was going to be demolished, and he took the opportunity. Yeah, he went there, shoot it. Let's fucking burn Although, this. Although the fire at the end looks kind of fake for a real fire, but I mean... Yeah, uh, yeah it does. It's like yeah. very bi-dimensional. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know if you agree, but I think that um, with Vincent Price, he acts really sort of in between melodramatic, but also really nuanced. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, because, you know, with his condition, he clearly can take his acting to melodramatic expressions and... Uh, you know, really clenching or, or, you know, piercing the characters with the, with heavy gazes. But then there are times where he needs to be more nuanced because he can't reveal what he knows to Philip about his wife, about, uh, about Philip's wife. And um, and so he, he's much more nuanced, um, much more contained. He just sort of glances subtly. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. And as we said, I mean... It's another element to his acting that really made the film. And without it, I mean, it probably would have been much, well, not bad, but much more superficial, I think. Yeah, I agree. I also, Although, yeah, yeah. Say, sure, sure, I was sure, going to say, say that I've also, I've only seen him in two other films, I think. I saw him in Laura, the, the Preminger film. I think he plays one of the characters. He's not a, the main character, but I think he's one of the love interests that is obsessed about Laura. Or something like that, I don't remember entirely. But the other film I saw him in was The Comedy of Horrors, which is like a, a Jack Turner film, the director of I Walked With a Zombie, Cat People, you know. And he. Not Tim no, Curry. That's, that's, that's a that's Rocky that's Horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. This, one is, this one is from around the same time, it's like 62, 63. Uh, and in that film, which it's 
it's the one Turner film that I, I don't like at all. And in that film, he's so over the top. It's like it's a comedy. It's shot very well, but it's so over the top. It's, a, it's like very conflicting the way it looks and the way it is in the acting and the story itself. And I didn't I did not like him. The price in that film, I thought he was really annoying. So in the in here, I was like, uh, I don't want more of that. So I was very surprised and pleased that he, he was really interesting. And then I watched uh, The Mask of the Red Death, which is also a Corman film. And he's great in that too. He's Again, he's the show. He, he steals everything. He's the best part. I think this was his first film with, with Corman or, or not. Uh, Husher? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. And it was definitely the first of a series of Edgar Allan Poe based films. Yeah. There's also The Pit in the Pendulum, but I didn't watch that. Mm -hmm. one. Uh, the only other film that I've seen with Vincent Price is actually, I think, I feel, has an homage to his career in the Macabre, and, which is Edward Scissorhands, if you've ever seen it. He is the creator of Edward Scissorhands, much like a Frankenstein monster and um yeah it's beautiful because he doesn't have i don't remember him having he doesn't have much scenes and he doesn't have much lines but he is up there in the castle training johnny depp <laughs> to to life and bring him to life and it's really sweet because you see this it's in the 90s so it's very this very old but still charming uh vincent price bringing this little scary kid a little to weird life, creation you know? <laughs> yeah he's so pinocchio yeah he's exactly and he's yeah. Uh, a morbid Geppetto. <laughs> 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 it really surprised me when I realized what... Because uh, I was just saying that the progression to the mystery in viewing it is not the most creeping thing, but of course you are curious about it. And I was curious to know what was the thing that um, Roderick was trying to hide. And when you understand uh, that it is not really about the history of the family being all murderers and thieves and, all, and whatnot, the moment with the paintings didn't really surprise me, but it was much more the moment where when Winthrop goes to the cellar with his bride to be and sees all the coffins and the skeleton. I think that that scene was interesting. And then the aftermath when when she becomes really dead, I, I wasn't expecting. I think it's it's a roller coaster of unexpected things. I think because I wasn't really expecting her to become for a sixties film. I think it was really kind of radical that uh, she's inside a coffin and you see her bloody hand. Uh, and then he's after this ghost that he both loves, but he's becoming something other, very scary, very to be repelled and be afraid of, which is this bloody zombie-like woman that you can't see. I think that uh, was, um, how can I say this? Um, interesting, pulling, gripping for, for, for a film that I was not expecting to surprise me. I wasn't very aware of the, of the be moving in terms of being, um, repelled by it or whatever throughout the film because I was interested but I wasn't either was this but at the same time I wasn't I wasn't expecting to be surprised I think I was just expecting to slide right in and okay it's a it's a horror mystery kind of thing but I was surprised by the end it was very unexpected I was very like held in by uh, the aftermath of things it was very morbid and I have read Edgar Allan Poe before just a couple of tales and he never really sorry Edgar Allan Poe fans out there but uh, it didn't never really utterly surprised me so um here i was okay interesting and i was always asking myself throughout the course of it how much of this of the writing is edgar Allan poe's you know talent and prose and, and how much of this is what the adaptation made uh and the direction made to be good i think that probably the ending is very much uh, the choices in directing are interesting yeah i didn't i i wasn't very familiar with corman in terms of like his films so I didn't know what to expect, and so I was surprised how impressed I was with a lot of the the filmmaking itself, like the way he shoots things, the way yeah, the color. Like for example, when Vincent Price and Winthrop are talking, the scene with the the portraits where he keeps cutting like almost like a montage mm -hmm. sequence with the they're speaking to each other, and then he cuts to the to the portraits. I, it's very dynamic, and I think also. I don't know, it creates a, a specific mood in regards to this family history. Like they're, they're always watching them and there's the weight of history. There's the weight of the house. And yeah, I think it works a lot. And there's so many little details. I love when, when they're at the funeral, 
uh, or like, not really a funeral or whatever. And her hand starts moving and Vincent Price is like, uh, uh, okay, let's close this. <laughs> and Winthrop is just so stupid. He's like, whoa, man, I'm so sad. It's like a very comical. At the same time, you you realize, like, it's comical, but at the same time, it's like, oh, he's putting, she's alive. He's putting her inside the coffin. That's, uh, that's yeah, horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there's that moment where you see her hand through the, like, her bloody mm -hmm. hand through the coffin, like, trying to get out. Yeah. It has, it, once again, it has very real tangible horror to it, which surprised me. How much, you know, I was, I was seeing, well, I saw very recently um, films from the 70s like The Exorcist and The Chainsaw Massacre, and a lot of filmmakers from the time, 70s, you know, New Wave, argued that we started fleeing or going away from the supernatural and the foreign monster, the Dracula, the Frankenstein, and going to the American home with these very... Um, domesticated evils i think and i mean far back in that Allan poe you know we have this example of that is happening right then and now in the beginning of the 60s this is a 1960 film of all these very real elements um who are painted in this supernatural light and i i think that that was what i was very surprised by it was mm -hmm. unexpected to me that oh this is a film actually about this very kind of um weird brother he has these very strange ideas about his family past and he's locking his sister alive in a coffin that's quite simple actually and um interesting <laughs> horrible <laughs> doesn't need to do much it, it's i was like i was expecting some ghost or anything but a every little detail can be linked back to something that is real yeah and like i was listening to an interview with corman and he i don't remember exactly what he was like he was i guess he was talking to a producer or something and they were telling him, but Carmen, there's, there's no monster in this film. <laughs> what are you going to make it? Because they were talking about the house of Usher before he made the film, like he, the development of it. And he's like, the house is the monster. <laughs> <laughs> That's the monster. And then, yeah, you watch the film in the house, like when he cuts to that shot of the crack, it's like very exaggerated. You're like, just fix that, man. But at the same time, it's very haunting. It's like. Like this house is crumbling the way that Vincent Price is crumbling. I actually remember the f the film Monster House, that animation, uh, which is actually a cool film. I've never but, watched um, it. But yeah, I mean, I was reminded of that as well in terms of the house being the monster. And okay, maybe in, in both cases there's a lot of other things behind it, but ultimately it's this mystery that that gets prolonged throughout the film. And always leaves you wondering exactly what's happening and if, if it's something that characters are imagining or or is it something actually real and um and so that doubt basically gets turned into it's the house that that's doing this um and yeah you see the cracks you see the sounds and sort of the hisses of, of the you know all the rushers that, that have died you have many elements of these things that that, that repeat um, but uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Although, I mean, if we have to talk about sort of negative, negative elements, I suppose. Um, I mean, I have to talk about Bristol, that that sort of uh, Butler character, because he's so undecided about how he feels about Madeline, and he's always sort of resigning to things like telling philip no no she's dead go move on or leave it's better for you or uh, it's all said and done now <laughs> sorry it's like geez try a little something i mean god damn it i mean the guy just wants to be alone cooking his food and not doing not doing any <laughs> effort i mean yeah do some effort it's like Please. it's a an exposition device at times i think the catalepsy stuff of yeah, that was very yeah. uns yeah, like a little, a, a little bit like yeah the writer like the writing not very good in that moment even, the reveal even at that moment when he could have sort of taken a bit of action he says that and then he just says oh no never mind she's fine it's nothing move on we've dealt with it for yeah, years he's Don't very worry. passive uh, like, kind oh of a God. pussy <laughs> he's just speaking oh and of course the catalepsy <laughs> the what <laughs> 
the what? <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh. Yeah. Like, how did you let that slip? That's not an yeah. easy word to let slip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I actually, I had to, to search what it, what it meant. So, like, it's not something that even fill up my... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, well, yeah like, exactly. You right know, away what? and searched it. <laughs> yeah. And he was like... The catalepsy? Uh, right, that word we all know about. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, what? Uh, what is yeah. that? He must, the butler just must say it three times every time he goes to sleep at night. <laughs> catalepsy, 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then he goes to sleep. It's like so training it. himself to yeah. subconsciously. For this this star moment, this moment <laughs> exactly. he's going to reveal the plot. Oh, catalepsy, oops, I <laughs> said something. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the grand the grand theme of this film is because you know I was I say this because with horror films sometimes especially you know bad ones not this one but bad ones you have this feeling that they're not really telling much uh, they don't have a very, very strong message or characters that that you can see that have um, important things to tell and even if it's a horror film through that genre tell a meaningful story and I think that um, I was thinking whether this film did this or not and uh, I mean I thought okay maybe the uh, I think the grand theme here is don't let your past um, you know or your family family sort of curses define you in a sense I think you can take that from this film you know yeah. because ultimately it's just you know living your life and not really caring about what came before modern horror films today they are a lot worse than this this is not bad oh yeah sure oh uh, yeah so absolutely you, know, you can find really i mean you know things that i could I, the nun i am not interested <laughs> in watching that i can just see by the account of the trailer that uh, just not yeah there are a lot of terrible horror films there's a renaissance a bit like a 24 horror films those are decent yeah, yeah, yeah. there's get out there's the jordan peele films which are decent but you know, you scroll through Netflix in the horror section, and you'll find a lot <laughs> of just garbage that pump being pumped out just for and the I'm, sake I'm of it. In this film, I'm spared the the stupid jump scares, you know. Uh, in, and in the Nun, I I can only see the trailer to be reminded of the stupidity of the of the horror genre being so kind of wasted in the mainstream of today. That you know, in the trailer, you have this kind of jump scare. You, the main protagonist, none, the innocent one, walking down an aisle, and then you see in the corridor behind her the monster and going for her, and it's like, okay, I'm gonna get scared. So that's that's the jump scare. But then actually, there's another second monster nun that comes from the side, like, and in the trailer it even comes with the sound effect. So it's like, ah, it's just like, <laughs> it's and like, I left. I it's saw incredible. the trailer. Uh, the links, the links that the uh, the monsters go through to scare the audience. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it just comments on the fact that I mean, these guys are so desperate they cannot trust on the the normal, you know, kind of jump scare, which would allow us to see maybe a bit of the monster and then kind of do it. No, you have to. Oh, you thought it was going to come from there? It comes from there. Razzle <laughs> <laughs> dazzle. It's ridiculous. Well, I said it well. I mean, it scares the art. It's it's scaring the art. It's not the actual character. I mean, the character doesn't doesn't even know exactly the sort of monster is walking about. So it's so stupid. I mean, it's kind it's... of a a meta thing, right? It's kind of a meta thing, you know. Where it, the film itself is aware that you know it needs but to like, be functional for, example, for an audience. Scream, like the Wes Craven film, does that, but it's the film is meta. It's supposed to be commenting on horror tropes themselves, right? The characters are speaking of, about horror films and about, ooh, we are in a horror film, whatever. Stuff like that. But these films, they have no, they're in, they have no pretense. It's like it's being meta sometimes just for the sake of like, ooh, see, we're self-aware, so it's not bad. No, it's still bad. <laughs> it's just using jump scares as an easy way to yeah, scare it's a audiences. Crutch. Yeah. Like, there's no mood. I prefer to be just, I don't care about being scared. Like this film wasn't scary, but there's like a mood. There's a, just a general exactly, yeah. feel yeah. to it that I like that. I, that's what I prefer. Like, I'm not going to judge the same way. I like a comedy. I'm not going to say the comedy is bad because I didn't laugh five times. Uh -huh. <laughs> like it's, I don't have to laugh. Like if I like the, the feel of it in general, and the same thing with a horror film, same way with the drama, I don't have to cry. To appreciate it, I think that's more of it. While these horror films, 
they're like we they have to feel scared and the way to do that is just put a monster in the super loud sound <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah, easy yeah, yeah. i mean one might argue that it started with the sound design um it's the sound guys <laughs> it's their fault <laughs> <laughs> but I don't I don't know I'd have to study the history of jump yeah, scares I, I wouldn't know but in, I mean today it's overwhelming how much they they amplify the sounds like I mean and not that non diegetically I mean just for us like completely out of the blue really big violins or whatever like Jesus tone it down I mean and then you're already expecting to be able to be scared because the music uh, you know, anticipates the scare, so it's like right. <laughs> it's like, oh, come it's not, on, it's just not scare even me. that they can do well. I mean, you have to anticipate it first. I mean, it's like if it was like a, an actual jump scare out of nothing, it might actually be scary. But yeah, exactly. there's so much prolonged waiting, and then the jump scare. It's like, I mean, you don't even do that well. I mean, fuck that. I mean. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's a cheat code. It's really like. <clears throat> Because they just want people to be like, oh, I was scared a lot of times because they fucking blasted <laughs> gigantic music in my ears. Yeah. So I guess the movie was good because I was a little scared. I mean, like, for a lot of people, that's, that's yeah, just exactly. about that's it. it. You know, I, I'm surprised every time someone gets up to me and talks about a horror film and says, just on the kind of a trailer, they say, oh, it must be good because I was scared during the trailer. It once happened to me that I showed, I think, two different trailers for two different horror films. One of which I liked, one of which I thought was garbage because of, of the, that element of to be scared or not scared, or what to be subtle or not subtle. And uh, the person said, oh, I like that other one because I was scared and the other one I wasn't. I think it was hereditary. Well, this is a language of subtlety. <laughs> it's eerie not uh, to be scared right away, you know? So it's more a question of the atmosphere than... Yeah. And, and that film specifically is an interesting example because, I mean, if you, if you see it and, and don't get bothered... I mean, yeah, okay, exactly in that sense of eeriness, but nonetheless, it's 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 bothering you. And I mean, if you see it and you're not bothered, I mean, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, because if you just go through normal and neutral, I did, that was I mean, the last not, film okay. that I was truly scared after watching it. I think right, it really bothered me. <laughs> the film was very unsettling. Uh, um There was only one time I I actually got scared in that film which was one jump scare one solitary jump scare in that film which is uh tony collette is kind of cleaning stuff in um some room in her house and uh the grandmother kind of appears in a flash you know while she's kind of cleaning and i was like oh, fucking shit <laughs> i was like, really scared i was not because once again i was is not expecting the lights or the, the lamp it's something like that i think and she's in a very still position and i'm like fuck shit and once again the music does not tell you that something's going to happen and, it, and it's a very domestic banal scene very realistic the, the thing she's just cleaning stuff and it's after conversation with her kid and so it's like i'm not expecting whatsoever that something scary is going to happen so pretty cool it's like pretty from that. cool yeah that's interesting yeah. now in the other one is like okay here's the scary moments now here's the moment where you can relax now here's the scary moment. Now the moment it's like no, make it uncertain. And they and they make very they make very easy associations. I mean, during the day everything's fine, then the night yeah. falls, and you know exactly. it's gonna be the scary scene. It's like uh, yeah, that's why I be unexpected. When movies are scary in the daytime, that's what's impressive. It's like when yeah, right. when it's Chainsaw? just Chainsaw Massacre. exactly. I mean, have have you seen Chainsaw Massacre? Who Miguel? I have. Anyone? I have. It's incredible. Uh, I haven't. Absolutely oh, incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Very, another one I was not expecting. I thought it was like a trashy slasher, just you know. At first, at first, I was very much feeling that until yeah. it goes to the terrible. Exactly. Of... It's very deceptive because it begins with the formulaic kids, very stupid, and then you get it. Oh, okay, they're, they're gonna get fucking murdered completely. I mean, they're thought... idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're fucking idiots. At times, I think it's stupid still, but but in a way that it doesn't come in the way of the horror, which is the main the main thing. For example, she takes her brother in a wheelchair to, to the to the <laughs> to the house, and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? It's just... And then the guy comes up, 
yeah, it's just seeing these figures of yeah. American But one, one of the innocence. things that I like about Chainsaw is the absurdity of violence. The, yeah. I, I oftentimes I laugh at the absurdity of violence, and I always talk. Sometimes I thought I, I want to make a film. I want to make my horror film and talk about the absurdity of violence because at, at times I'm I'm sleeping at night or whatnot, and I see these images of things that could be really scary, and I think I haven't seen this anywhere else. Like just just the image of someone smiling in an awkward uh, an awkward way for a long time. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Just, it's, you know, scary. It's just it's weird. Like I want to put that in in a scene, and um, Chainsaw Massacre. It's just the, the whole performance, the heightened performance of the killer himself, just makes me laugh. Just to go into that room. Which is clearly not a good room, full of spikes <laughs> and shit. And they enter, oh, what's this? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, all, you never know. Like, it's just out of nowhere they appear and get murdered. It's like you feel, oh, I'm following this character. They must be safe for a little bit. Nope, they had immediately. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then that dinner scene with the family, the family dinner. Oh, yeah, how Jesus. disturbing is so, that? Uh, and the ending, like, it's oddly like beautiful for some reasons like him with the chainsaw very freeing like he's yes, yes, i don't yes. know it's it's like what are you doing man <laughs> i feel horrible and but she, at the same time i feel and she's like, like full of adrenaline and and screaming but she's also laughing at the thought of being yeah. removed from it it's like a movie that it it's just a nightmare and then it ends and it it's like nothing was resolved but yeah it's very it actually fulfilling. happens what if you and your friends ended up because it all happens very shortly in kind of a day, an afternoon. You know? So it's kind of like they pick up the idea of, of a basic summer afternoon and and being interrupted. The idea of being interrupted by something horrible that you're just wandering around the house, kind of seeing something different and exploring. And suddenly this very unpredictable thing happens of this murderous guy in another house. Yeah. Coming by you and killing you. It's just um, incredible. <laughs> nothing is... You know, there, there's no, uh, you don't, there's no, this, unlike the Husher, where, okay, you enter the haunted house, you see the tropes, you know something's going to happen. Is there's always the, the question of, you know, you know, there's a weird host played by Vincent Price. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the rest, all right? The paintings, and there's all these points. That, no, it's, it's more linked to finding out what's what's happening rather than yes, us not it's, knowing it's also, that it's there. It's a different program. So, yeah, um, completely. This one is like Husher is like there's a structure to it that is yeah, which doesn't invalidate what's going Yeah, exactly. It's but, different. Uh, just it's a just completely different thing. approach. Yeah, and that, again, like that seventies type of filmmaking was about finding new approaches to I mean, these seventies things. Great horror films and the Alien. I mean, the Thing. Oh yeah, I think the Exorcist oh, the is thing, also. Yeah. The thing yeah, is yeah, 80s, yeah. but it's Seven. right there. Uh, the the Exorcist has several cuts, and uh, oh yeah, the thing is 80s, yeah. The the, so the it's Exorcist pretty much 70s. The Exorcist has a director's cut, which I think I've seen that. The opening is pretty cool. It opens with uh, an Arabic chant. Never watched it. Once the never watch Exorcist. Nope. Oh, watch it's cool. It. cool. I think I like um, it. But Alien for me is at the top. Alien, Alien is really good. But Alien, Great I never associate perfectly with horror. It's more like uh, science fiction. But it's science fiction horror. It's two things. It's the um, two, yeah. Yeah, and it's very H.P. Lovecraft. When I like H.P. Lovecraft, um, yeah, uh, the feeling of science and and nature being bigger than you, and you, don't, and you don't know what awaits you, and the cosmos is something that does not care for you and will eat you. That's very much H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also dark and gooey and yeah, the, the <laughs> film is so amazing. <laughs> Something very intrinsically, the, he says it himself, and that's the reason for picking up Geiger, the artist that makes the design of Alien, that um, I want to search something central about the monster and how he enters into you, the mouth and etc. And um, dangerously uh, sexual, I think. So, um, and you see that. Yeah, and the idea of this being sort of a spaced. Uh... Uh, closed uh, space where I mean it's so claustrophobic, and uh, there's a clear barrier to the characters that adds to the to the to the tension, I guess. They're all dressed in um, trucker suits. The the characters from Alien, which is uh, interesting, <laughs> like jeans. Uh, yeah. Shirts, very unspace-like. It's like, like they cowboys. were. 
refueling at a pump station, but it's crazy. <laughs> refueling at the pump station, yeah. The face hugger monster is actually animal stuff, real animal stuff. It's not the prosthetics, I think. I I read it somewhere that it's like some intestine thing, like cow intestine. So John Hurt really had that thing in his face that was animal crap. So yeah, interesting. A lot of genuine things in that film, including that scene with the. Improvised scare, uh, scared faces, like when that thing rips out of the body. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. This is it, you know? Yeah. So Ridley really wanted to be authentic every step of the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Alien is like one of. It's a film that every time I watch it, I'm like, I really like this. And then a t some time passes, I'm like, I don't know, like, I don't remember it that well. I don't know why I liked it so much. Then I rewatch it and I'm like, okay, then no, I really like this. And then again and again, I'm always in that yeah, cycle. So, but it's, yeah, yeah when I, it's really good. It's really fun. Once, but remember images of it that are really, yeah. the way he uses darkness in that film. Yeah. It's really cool. Just, yeah. Those images stick to you. The, 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 the getting to your face. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. no. I saw David Fincher speak recently of uh, doing Alien 3. He knew the script was shit, but because yeah, he liked course. Alien so much, he, he did it. <laughs> And then he accepted advice from the producers, which was stupid. <laughs> he said, like, "Never do that." <laughs> uh, he said, "Like um, the producers told him, look, kid, you don't do films with your friends. You do you do films with uh, skillful, you know, um, people in the industry already." And, and then he said, "What happened afterwards was that I was working with people that resented me and <laughs> were saying, who is this twerp making this film?' You know." <laughs> Uh, so yeah, you know, we make films with your friends. That's it. That's the, the takeaway. That's all for today, folks. Uh, if you'd like to reach out and suggest a film for the next episode, you can find us on the podcast official Instagram and Facebook pages. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao ciao.